So, welcome to my presentation, a case study of side channel analysis using decoupling capacitor power measurement with the Open ADC. This was originally presented at the Foundations and Practices of Security Symposium in Montreal, Quebec City. I'm from Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada. So, quick overview of what I'll go through talking about. Um, a little bit about what is DIF DPA and SPA, the tools you require for this, um, and we can build from that the sort of minimum hardware requirements. I'll talk about my own board I designed that meets those minimum hardware requirements at a much lower cost than an oscilloscope, as well as shunt measurements that we typically do with DPA type attacks, and finally move on to the decoupling capacitor measurement. So with simple power analysis or differential power analysis, at the end of the day, we just need to measure power somehow. This may be a shunt, for example, inserted into the VCC or similar line, or it may take the form of a magnetic field probe or other probes. In simple power analysis, we'll typically just do one measurement and directly infer what's being performed. In differential power analysis, we're many, many measurements um, and between those two measurements, we'll try to get some different statistical properties. It depends a bit on the attack, exactly what this means. So when we're doing them, what does our setup look like? Here's sort of a typical-ish acquisition setup. So we have at the bottom here um, a board there. And so this board is our target. Um, on this target in particular, I have a FPGA and that FPGA is running some software. Um, here what I have is a EM probe. So this EM probe is trying to measure magnetic field due to power being used by that device. Finally after the EM probe we'll have a bit of a amplifier here and the amplifier boosts the signal before it finally goes into the oscilloscope here and then we have the oscilloscope at the back. The oscilloscopes you see used tend to be fairly high-end, so let's take a look at other sort of papers in this area. So I've picked a few different papers showing uh, side channel attacks that mention specifically the oscilloscopes, and I've given you a sort of very ballpark figure of the cost of those scopes. So the oscilloscope you use will depend a lot on what type of attack we're doing and what type of target we have. So for example, you may have a hardware target. That is, you have AES implemented in hardware on the device, and you tend to need a faster oscilloscope. If we have a target where AES is implemented in software on the device, we may be able to get away with a slower oscilloscope. So typically, though, we can see we, we are using still fairly high end. I mean, at the cheapest end, you might be able to get away with a $1,000 oscilloscope. Um, what I'm going to be looking at more is hardware, attacking hardware implementations, and in those cases you tend to need a much higher end oscilloscope. So I'll give you one example of this. So this is the Sasebo G2 board. This is what was shown in that photo for the typical acquisition setup. The board's running, in this case, at 24 megahertz, and it's a hardware implementation, so you can see on each clock cycle something's occurring, and we only have a very limited number of clock cycles. So we do need, if you attack this with a regular oscilloscope, high speed. It's been shown that, you know, anything I believe, maybe 250 mega samples is the absolute slowest you can go before the attack just fails completely. So in this case, I'm measuring up four giga samples per second, which is maybe a little faster than needed. But we can see why we need this high speed is that what's happening is the data of interest is really typically somewhere on these clock edges. And often it's either this point or maybe this point. Um, but it's some repeatable point directly related to where the clock is occurring. The problem is that in a regular oscilloscope, the sample speed is free running. So the sample clock is just sort of running all the time. When you get the trigger, there's some delay between when that trigger has occurred and when the first sample will occur. Even if you know this delay, um, it's still going to contribute an error because every time there will be some jitter to where that sample's occurred, 
and that jitter will basically appear as noise. So what we could do better is if we had a way to sort of derive our sample clock from the device clock, and then we would always know for, that we're sampling at exactly the same point. You know, we're always sampling right there, we're always sampling right there, right there, right there, without needing all those intermediate samples. And it would look something like this. So in the top, I have 100 mega sample per second, and I'm sampling effectively that same thing I just showed you, um, but at 100 mega samples per second. And this is with a clock that's free running, so not derived from the device clock. And this free running clock, we can see it just looks a mess. So there's 10, there's 10 overlaid samples here of the device performing an AES encryption with the exact same plain text and the same encryption key and everything. So it should be the same power signature. But because of this jitter, it's not. And it you know just looks like sort of garbagey. And we can see, for example, you can sort of see there's two points here and here that have occurred on each side of the peak compared to other points where the peak is up here. Um, so even if you're using techniques to try to resynchronize this, we've still lost a lot of data, and it's still going to be difficult. Compare that to the bottom. Here I'm sampling at 96 mega samples per second. That 96 mega samples per second is derived from the 24 megahertz device clock, though. And what you see is you can barely see the difference. There's a tiny bit sort of down in here. You can see, and there is 10 here, I promise. You can see, you know, a few over here, a bit of noise. Um, but it's so repeatable that you can barely tell the difference. And what you'll see is that the results will show this lets you perform attacks um, at much slower speeds than you otherwise would be able to. So we can kind of take those and define a generic set of requirements and a sort of generic plan for what our system will look like. So we'll have, as I mentioned, this clock input so that we can use the clock of the device um, to trigger the ADC. We'll have some clock multiplier and phase shift. So this is used if we need to shift around where the sample is occurring relative to the clock edge. And we may want to sample you know, still faster than de the device if the device is running very slow. And it generally simplifies our life because we don't have to search as many points. So, you know, if you're running at four times the sample speed, then you don't need to shift the entire clock period looking for where is the real point of interest. And for other attacks, you may need to oversample too. You may, or you may need to sample faster than that clock. So we have some way of putting that clock into the ADC. There is a free running clock just for convenience as well. Another thing we want to use is this um, amplifier at the input. So we'll have different input signals. We may have a magnetic field probe. We may have you know, that shunt I mentioned. And they need vastly different amounts of amplification. Normal oscilloscopes aren't as well designed for this. Um, normal oscilloscopes often don't do very, very small signals. Well, that's why you need the external amplifier. So if we can integrate it, we get rid of that. Finally, we would want some you know, memory and just standard stuff. This would be like any other oscilloscope. We have some control logic and some sample logic. So this is what you end up getting out of it. Is This is an open source design I created, the OpenADC. And you combine the OpenADC with just a normal FPGA board, and you can get a side channel analysis platform. You can use this platform to do attacks on real devices. So, you know, rather than costing the thousands of dollars, this FPGA board is $90, and this ADC platform is, depending, you know, you can build it yourself or buy one pre-made, anywhere between about $60 to $150. Um, it has some additional features you may or may not need, for example, things like transformable coupled inputs. Um, but we can see we have this, you know, this is the clock input, and this is typically the low noise amplifier input. Uh, obviously, software is needed. So here's two examples. This is the Sasebo G2. Um, again, this is with a shunt measurement, this example. So we can set up a shunt measurement for that, or this is with something using the key lock algorithm. Um, we can see because it has that DDR memory, you can actually put a huge amount of samples on it, like 48 million samples can be stored on this you know, $90, $90 FPGA board. So that's sort of 
um, stored you wouldn't even no necessarily normally get on any sort of low-end oscilloscope. And you may need that when you're doing the initial analysis of cryptographic devices, when you don't know where did the encryption occur. So the results are great, as I mentioned. Here's a comparison. So this is the global success rate, how successful an attack was with how many traces I recorded. So this is using the Sasebo G2 board, which, again, there's been sort of a number of other people have said, well, it simply fails at the 100, 100 mega samples per second. It just did not work at all, which is what I also saw with a regular oscilloscope. Um, so here's using two giga samples per second. H-field probe is a pretty sort of good baseline. And we can see it crossing there. Um, my board at 96 mega samples per second, so 1 20th of the sample speed, is performing almost as good. It takes a few more traces in that example. Um, another technique that I'm going to be talking about next, we can see it maybe performed a tiny bit better. It's very close, though. It's sufficient to say that for the most case, you should expect to be able to get the same type of performance with this capture hardware as you can with that high-end oscilloscope. So the second part of this talk talks about how we can sort of simplify a bit actually doing that current measurement. So if we want to attack, say, a typical you know microcontroller or other embedded device target, we may have a board like this. Um, we have a lot of decoupling capacitors. That's one issue. And it can be hard to isolate the power because, you know, here they're going through vias to a power plane underneath this. It's very difficult to just cut one of those traces. Um, in this case, there's no pins you can lift even. And there's a schematic of it showing, you know, there's quite a large decoupling. So the easy spot to insert a shunt would be right at the battery, but that's not going to give us good results. I mean, even if you remove these capacitors, you still have a lot of capacitance in the power plane itself. So you might use an, a magnetic probe. Um, that's definitely one way to do it and sort of the reference which I compare it to. When we use a magnetic probe, we often have this preamplifier, as I mentioned, and then connect that up to the scope. But a somewhat more reliable way that I found to do it was to actually target those decoupling capacitors are going to see the high current flowing through them. Um, so we can wrap a wire around the decoupling capacitor and effectively get this inductive wrap, inductive coupling um, that we're using to measure the current flowing through that specific capacitor. This has some advantages because you can help to isolate the current going through a specific part of the chip into you know, one of the power pins. So you may have analog pins, you may have a PLL pin, um, and you might have a digital pin, so you can isolate just the capacitor on that digital pin specifically if, if the supplies are separated like that, which they may frequently be. So here it's on a 0402 size capacitor, and this is Cebo G2. So it is quite possible to do even on a small device. Um, so here is an example of wrapping a wire around those capacitors. So what you can see is that you basically can just form some sort of edges here and then wrap the wire around that, like so. Uh, so it's fairly simple to do. So here's the results of it. So what I'm comparing this to is my inductive pickup, which is C here. Um, again, I'm using this global success rate, how many traces to get a success, 80% successful. Uh, and what you'll see is that it's actually very similar. In my case, it was a tiny bit better than the standard magnetic field probe. Um, definitely better than the shunt measurement. The shunt measurement's way up here. And I also tried a few other similar techniques, again, trying to target the current going through one specific area. And this slide shows all of them grouped together. And C here is the success rate of my measurement technique, the wrap, and D here is the H-field or magnetic field probe. Um, so you can see it's, it is at least as reliable as that magnetic field probe. And again, we'll see the same thing. Here's with the open ADC. Um, so this, this is another test case. So here I have the inductive pickup. Here I have the H-field probe. Here I have the inductive pickup with a DSO. Um, so I switch those two, and then 
the DSO with the H-Field probe. So again, it's, it is still performing a little better. The real advantage of it um, is that for attacking real devices, you may even find it easier because here I have, you know, that real device I showed earlier. And to give you an idea of how well it works, um, here's an inductive pickup mounted on that capacitor going to the scope. And here's an attempt measuring it with a current shunt. Uh, this is averaged. You'll notice a number of times. The reason for doing this is to remove all of the noise on the current shunt. And you'll see the current shunt there. It's basically there was no signal. Um, this shunt is I'm attempting to measure it right at the input. And it's because all of those decoupling capacitors are simply removing the signal. Um, it's just not possible, basically, to see it through such heavy decoupling. The inductive pickup, you get this very nice signal, and you can easily see sort of each clock cycle occurring here. So I'm measuring this with, as you can see, just a normal DSO. And here I switch, actually. So at this point, I'm doing, I was just running a simple program doing I believe no op operations, and here I'm doing a multiply, so we can see that the current has gone up a tiny bit, and it goes up in the same here. So we can see this current increase. So it does provide us quite a good signal. The real other advantage of it is repeatability. Um, if you want someone to replicate that same experiment, it's moderately simple to tell them I use this gauge of magnet wire, you know, maybe from this supplier if you want to get specific, this many wraps around this capacitor. And that should be enough to get the same um, results again. So this is also really good because if you want to store your results, you want to shelve this unit, you know, you can easily do this wrap, maybe put some epoxy over it, and keep that same hardware, the exact same physical setup. It can be difficult with a magnetic field probe to keep the exact same physical setup because you're positioning it in three, 3D space. So, you know, you have to have it positioned here and this way. And they're also fairly expensive, so it's unlikely you're going to do some way keep that probe, you know, in the exact same spot shelved with this hardware. So side channel analysis can be performed with very low cost hardware, which this presentation has tried to show. And it showed that in two aspects. One of them was the, the acquisition digitizing hardware. One of them is the probe setup. With the acquisition hardware, it's critical that you synchronize the samples clock to the device clock. And that's how we achieve this very low cost design. I've also showed how to measure current without modifying the bro the board, and this is just a low-cost probe, we call it, and it's just a wrap around, you know, a specific decoupling capacitor. In this case, it also helps you consider repeatability when doing measurements. So by repeatability, what I mean is that other people elsewhere can try to repeat this exact same experiment based on, you know, your experimental setup without resorting to some very specific 3D positioning of the probe. In addition, for your own purposes, it's very easy to shelve part of the setup um, with the hardware and, you know, keep it for a year, pull it back out, and be confident little has changed. So if you have questions, you can email them to my address there, and you can visit me on the web at newae.com slash openadc. Thanks for watching.